How does GDPR affect you as a school? We're going to talk about that next on the EdTech Vlog. Hi, my name is Dr. Matt Harris, and this is the EdTech Vlog. Today we're going to talk about a recent um, law that came into effect in May 2018 called GDPR. You may have heard of this, you may have not, but it affects you. So you know how you go onto websites now and you have to accept the, the cookies policy? You're kind of like, why did that start? This law, in effect, made that begin. And it's important to understand why I'm bringing that up. It's not because I, I want you to understand the rules and regulations around cookies on a website is more for you to understand that this particular data protection law that's come into place has worldwide implications which means it affects you as a school let me get let me let me say that again gdpr affects you as a teacher and you as a school now i'm saying that as a blanket statement because it is technically true but as we talk, you're going to probably wonder, okay, how is that possibly true? This is not, there's no worldwide law that affects everybody. So let me talk about GDPR a little bit, because you might have heard about it in the news, you might be talking about it at your schools, and your peers might be discussing it. Um, let, me, let me give you an overview, just to give you a primer on, on what you need to know and how you need to change some of your practices um, to be in compliance with GDPR and why it affects you as an individual and as an institution. And then maybe you'll get an understanding. Now, let me throw this out at the, uh, at the outset. Um, GDPR is an incredibly complicated law. It is nuanced and has details that are I th like 500 pages deep. So for us to be able to go over it in five to 10 minutes is not realistic. So my suggestion to you is after you watch this video, um, what I'd like you to do is go out and do some research on your own. There's a number of materials around how to help you with GDPR, um, how it, it really impacts you on, a, on more in depth, and some best practices on how to implement some changes in policies and procedures and provisioning within any institution, specifically education. And if you get confused or you're having some challenges, I help schools on this all over the place. It's, it's kind of part of the scope of what I do. I, I do ed tech, I do IT, I do data systems. And this one hits all of that. So if you need some help, you can contact me directly, either through YouTube or Twitter, and I'll talk about those at the end. So what is GDPR? It's actually called EU GDPR, the European Union General Data Protection Regulation. General Data Protection Regulation, GDPR. It is an EU law, so it's part of the European Union, but the way they've structured it has done a few things which means it has a globalized impact and this is where it hits you. So the GDPR is the most comprehensive um, user focused data protection law on the books worldwide. And it's leading a trend that started a few years ago where data protection laws are becoming more of the norm in, in countries around the world. Now I'm in Singapore and we have something called the Personal Data Protection Act. And I had the pleasure of working with the Personal Data Protection Commission, the PDPC, to translate some of the language and some of the provisions for schools in Singapore so they can understand what these rules and regulations meant. The GDPR matches a lot of these provisions. And so as I've been reading through the GDPR, I'm like, yeah, I already know that. So what I'm hoping to do right now is to help you understand some of the key provisions within GDPR because they do affect you. Now, you're thinking, Matt just talked about a Singaporean law, so 5 million people in a little corner of Asia, and the EU. That, those two places are not where I live. Singapore, I agree, doesn't, doesn't affect you, other than having an understanding of GDPR. The EU one, though, does affect you in a couple ways. Number one, it's becoming the model by which other countries, states, um, provinces, whatever you want to say, are developing their own data protection laws. So in the United States, we have HIPAA and COPA, um, and there's a few other data protection rules, but those are, and they're geared towards students and health patients and all that, uh, FERPA. Um, those are geared towards, towards, towards patients and, and students and whatnot. 
but they're not as all-encompassing and as clear in language as GDPR is. So other countries that are in the development of their data protection policies, and they are coming everywhere across the world, in both the developing world and in, quote-unquote, the first world, whatever that means, um, these sorts of regulations are coming and they're modeling after GDPR. So if you understand GDPR, you'll be prepared when a similar regulation comes into your country or your state or, or whatever it is. In fact, even the United States is making some changes to their data protection stuff. <clears throat> There's just some conflict between the federal and the state approaches, which means some of the states are taking this on on their own. Okay, so you just need to be prepared for that. The other piece, which does make it applicable to you, is this notion of who, um, who, is, a f um, who is regulated by the EU. By this, by this provision. And the way they have it stated is that if you are working with EU citizens, so citizens of, of European Union countries, um, or holding data or interacting with, with um, companies in the EU or holding data for companies or individuals from the EU, it affects you. <clears throat> so imagine that. You're at a school in Iowa and you just happen to be using um, an online tool that's storing some data in the EU, or you have one student from Sweden in your school, yeah, GDPR affects you. Now, there's gonna be some legal complexity and there's some governance issues that make this really challenging to enforce, but better to be on the right side because these changes are gonna to come to your, your locality anyway. So let's jump into GDPR itself so that you know how to approach it, but do know, again, as I'm saying, GDPR affects you as an individual and as a school. So it's better to know it than to assume that this European law that's from the other side of the world doesn't affect me. It does. Just period, full stop. Okay, glad we're in agreement. So let's talk about GDPR. GDPR, as I said, is the most um, clearly written law around the rights, regulations, and rules around uses of data, storage of data, protection, erasure, all of that for users around the world. Now, when we come to student data privacy, which is a very, very critical issue all over the world, GDPR governs that pretty clearly. And there are some elements, as you're digging in deeper, that you need to, to have understanding about that are your, um, your responsibilities under GDPR. So what are a few of them? Let's start out with the, the simplest and easiest one. You need to have a DPO, a DPO, a data protection officer. There needs to be somebody within your school that is designated as the point of contact and the one that ensures that, that GDPR or whatever the data regulations are within your country are being abided by. Does this need to be a full-time position? No. Can it be an administrator that has a lot of interactions with data? Absolutely. I, I wouldn't make it a teacher. And I would caution against making it the IT person because the IT person is mostly connected to the systems, not the data contained therein. So identify some person, add it to their job description or give them as a release or something, they have to be a DPO. So if somebody comes to your institution and says, who is your DPO, your data protection officer, that person should be clearly identified. And they can be identified through some communication form on your website, through another thing that's very easy to have and you should have, and that is a privacy policy. You need to have a privacy policy on all of your digital communications. Very easy to create one. There's a number of sites that'll help you build them for 50 bucks, something like that. You can put that privacy policy on your website and then you're covered. So a privacy policy, and a data protection officer. Those are two elements that are critical from a compliance perspective. And they're the easiest. The rest of it gets a little more challenging. Um, the, the GDPR then outlines some rules, requirements, and regulations around uses of data and protection of data. So let's talk about protection. You have to show that you are protecting any personal data that is stored on your system, which of course opens up a question that we're gonna answer in just a minute but let's talk about protection. Do they specify what type of protection? No, and they never will. No, no regulation like this will ever tell you the specifics, but you need to be able to clearly state, we are protecting through this level of security, we've got physical protections, we're using this sort of password protection on our network and on our systems. Those are things that you need to have clearly defined, even if someone else is doing it for you. So if you're using Google to store all your 
all your student data around um, student performance, fine. Understand how their security measures and retention policies are working so that you can clearly state that. Now, the question that you're probably asking yourself is, what data? What are you talking about? What data does this, does this cover? Now, this one uh, defines it in a number of ways. I'm gonna use the, the Singapore definition because it helps us understand a little bit more. Anything that creates, that is identifiable data, so a name, a picture, a phone number, an email address, uh, some sort of identifying number like a social security number, a passport number, anything that is a personal or identifiable information is considered data that is covered by this. Now, it will also go further around performance data for employees, human resources records, medical information, and because it is the EU, they do talk about sexual orientation, um, political preferences. Those are all considered personally identifiable data, and it has to be protected. So you need to have a very clear protection strategy. Now, beyond the protection strategy, you also have some rules in case there are some breaches. If there is a breach, you have to report that breach to the users that are affected by the breach. Okay, so if somebody gets into your Google system or your student information system, your finance or HR, you have to inform. You are by law required to inform those people. If you do not, there are sanctions. And the sanctions are, of course, financial in nature and are pretty large. This is a number, th a number one thing that has scared a number of large corporations that do a lot of work. In, um, in the EU and should be of concern to you. I mean, we're talking thousands and thousands of euros for every breach and every miscommunication or, or hidden piece of information. So if you have a breach, report it, be transparent, be clear with the user what happened. So that needs to be a policy or a procedure that you write within your school. And it can be for employees, parents, teachers, um, students, whatever, whoever's data you're holding, you have to you have to report to them or their their guardians that there has been a breach. And then there's a lot of regulations around access, retention, erasure, portability around personal data. And the idea being the central the central idea here is that you are housing personal data on all of your students and employees and all these folks, but it does not belong to you. It belongs to the user, and that's how you should treat it. It could be confidential, but it belongs to them. Now, there's a bit of gray area around performance data, especially around employees, qualitative data connected to them for business purposes, and, and that's something that you can deal with on your own, um, whether you need to allow access or not. You need to be able to make a business case anytime somebody asks for data and you don't allow it for them. If it's personally identifiable, you gotta give it to them. If it has a business case, that is not as personally identifying or is, um, is around performance for them um, that has opinion based, you don't have to provide access to that, but you do need to follow some of the erasure and portability rules, okay? So around access, if it's personally identifiable information, the user has right to access that information. They have the right to access and say, what information do you have on me, on my kids, and whatever that is. And you, by law, are required to give them that. Now, for a school, what that means is you need to have that information well organized, and you need to have a way to access it. And if somebody comes in, you need to have a way to report that information without reporting on other people and kind of creating a breach situation. And that's easily done if you've got a student information system that's robust or some centralized data system. You can do that. You just have to map out the processes within your school of providing access. Okay? Then there's, an, there's a, retention, a retention clause or a sunset clause. And basically what it says is you need to have policy or procedure or, or something internally that talks about how and when you will delete information, or kind of like a sunset clause. And this is a little nuanced, and I'm not going to go all the details here, but basically, you know, if you've got a, a, student, a student or a potential employee that doesn't actually join the institution, you need to have a policy for when you delete that information. So, you know, the joke always being, well, we'll keep your resume on file for six months, and if anything comes up, we'll call you. At that six-month mark, you have to get rid of it. So you have to have a way of getting rid of the paper and the, the electronic versions. You can't keep them in perpetuity anymore. For people that are on-site, you need to have some, there's a, some nuances about what type of information you can save for how long. And there's usually a government requirement on how long you have to keep certain paper records. But the electronic ones need to go away after a while. 
So is it 10 years, 20 years, 50 years? You have to state that and understand it pretty clearly. Okay? So you have to have a retention or sunset thing. Um, and then last, there has to be a portability. So if a user comes in and says, I want to take my data and send it somewhere else, you, you have to do that. Okay, you have to be able to port it out somewhere else. And along the same line, so you have to give a format of doing it, or it, it can be complicated, and you don't have to be prepared for every contingency, but you need to find a way to meet that request. It's their, it's their legal right to take their data with them. And then whatever you maintain beyond that kind of belongs to you. The other piece, and this, this is also a very nuanced element of the law, if they tell you to erase everything, you're supposed to do it. Now, you have them telling you to erase things versus the business requirement of keeping it and even like legal compliance about I need to keep information about certain children or, or, or performance data or whatever that is. You have to navigate those two internally and be able to explain to a third party why you made the choice around retention um, on your site. So if you account for all of those, so the protection, the portability, the access, the sunsetting, the, the policies, you generally have you generally have GDPR covered. But do know that it is going to take some time up front. And this is like flossing. You know, you're not going to think about it or care about it until you get a cavity. Once you have a breach or you have somebody complaining and they know their rights around GDPR, then you're going to have a problem but it has affected you since May 25th, 2018, or whatever the exact date was that it went into effect, it does affect you as a school. So my suggestion to you is start coming up with these policies and procedures, download some resources, create a, a data protection document or something, identify your DPO and put in your privacy policy, um, and, then just, and then just provide some sort of regular schedule of checking your, your security measures and your access rules and rights, okay? If you do that, you'll, you'll be okay. Um, or you can hire a consultant, or you can help have somebody come in and help you. Um, there are a number of people that do it. I do it if you want some help. Um, large corporations have brought in entire teams to look at their data security and access rights and all those sorts of things. But it is something you do need to take a, take a, a good look at. So hey, that's, that's GDPR in a nutshell. Do me a favor. Um, it, it, down below here, um, subscribe to my channel, and we're going to talk about other things that might be a little bit more exciting around data usage in schools. We'll talk about big data and business, um, <clears throat> business analytics around data, using data for decision making, constructing systems, um, and getting out ahead of maybe some of these things coming around AI that might be affecting you as schools. I'll talk about that um, within this vlog over the next few months or year or so. Um, or if you want to send a comment or send me a note and tell me something you'd like me to talk about or go more in depth, be it at GDPR or anything else, please go ahead and do that. You can do that here through YouTube. <clears throat> Or you can follow me on Twitter. My handle is at MattHarrisEDD, and I talk a lot about data. Um, I help a lot of schools around uh, cybersecurity and GDPR. Um, I talk about things that are, are important to you and your operations. Send me a note, and we'll go through that. Thank you very much for listening. Have a great day. Bye.